All right, welcome to a long overdue Going Ballistic podcast. I'm here with Jason. Say hi, Jason. Hi, everybody. We're back to talk to you about his uh, AR-15 build project and to start tackling some more topics from what you guys have sent in via email. I really appreciate all the feedback so far, guys. It's been great. Uh, it's not motivating me to do more podcasts, although it should. <laughs> we'll, we'll try and get more going. I'm sorry. Just <laughs> uh, Life for both of us gets in the way, but I know uh, a lot of you guys are looking forward to it, to uh, hear the next podcast, and uh, I promise to at least try to be better. So if this is your first time listening to the podcast, you can find more information about it at the podcast's website at goingballisticpodcast.com. And if you enter a slash and the show's number after that URL, you can find out more details about this episode. So this is episode number 11. So you'll be able to go to goingballisticpodcast.com forward slash 11, as in the number 11. And you will see links we might be talking about. You'll find extra information that we might refer to during the podcast. You can see more from there. Uh, We really appreciate it. If you like the show, first off, tell other people about it. But second, go ahead and subscribe to whatever method you use. Uh, iTunes is is the biggest by far method most of you guys use. But if you're using something else, subscribing through that too helps. And it all goes through to, uh, to to count towards the numbers that people are listening to the podcast. And, and it helps keep this going. So we really appreciate it. Uh, so first, Jason, how's the rifle going? The rifle is going great. And probably the worst part about the whole thing. I can't wait to do another one. Uh, <laughs> so, have you come, come up with a name for it yet? Do you, do you name your guns? No, no. Other than this is Jason's custom rifle. Uh, it's about as custom as it gets with the serial number and everything else. Yeah. So, the problem with guns that custom is you know you're going to be buried with it, right? You're never going to be able to sell uh, it. No, never going to sell it, but Tucker's going to have a nice gift later on. Nice, nice, nice. Ah. Uh. If you do consider a name, I recommend something like Palomino because that thing has so many different colors. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, for those of you that have him following along, Jason's building this Area 15 project. We decided we'd break it down into different episodes. You can follow along piece by piece. We started off with the lower receiver because not only is that the heart of the gun, legally that is what the firearm is. So we started talking about that. Then we talked a little about the internal components of the lower. Then we worked our way back Last time, we talked about buttstocks and buffer tubes and buffers and, and what those can do and your options uh, for um, comfort for using the gun and for operation of the gun. Now we're going to work our way straight forward and we're going to go into the upper receiver today. But Jason's upper and lower receiver, instead of doing the forged option like he was going to, he decided to go with the billet because it was looks pretty cool. And this place he went to, what's the name of the place again, Jason? Uh, Lake... Tactical. And they're giving people that listen to the podcast a percentage off, aren't they? Yes, 5%. All right, so you mentioned the podcast. You save a little bit of money there. Uh, they do some really uh, good-looking custom anodized colors, which I think is great. And although I like uh, a Cerakoted or a Duracoat or whatever, gun coat, whatever company you use, painted gun as much as the next person, having it be anodized into the metal is just way more durable the way to color the gun. And it kind of makes a neat... I don't know if translucent is the right word, but kind of a neat color to the metal, doesn't it? Oh, it's it's great. And I ended up not going with a shiny anodized. Mine's more of a matte finish. Because you're tactical. That's right. <laughs> uh, Jason, you did a uh, olive drab green lower with a tan upper. Uh, bronze, yeah. Bronze. <laughs> bronze. <laughs> All right, a bronze upper. Uh, black handguards. Right? And yep. you're going to do a black buttstock. Yep. All right, so what I think it's kind of cool is most people change the color of the handguards and the buttstock because that's easy. But uh, you're you're making the center different color, which I think is kind of cool. It'll at least be very unique. So you've jumped ahead a little bit, which is great because you have to wait a little bit on ordering components. But you have it all assembled except for just a couple pieces, right? Yeah. So tomorrow I'm supposed to receive the buttstock. It should be... Uh at my door tomorrow afternoon and then after that the only components i will be missing will be a gas block and a barrel all right yeah so the the, the barrel's coming in i i ordered it for jason i will talk more about that when we get there but it's a, a jp rifles barrel uh i even set myself up as a dealer with them because i'm going to be using them for a bunch of other stuff for projects too and we can uh sing all the virtues of the jp barrels when we get there um but yeah your stuff's coming in i've seen the pictures and it, look, it looks pretty neat I, I can't wait for it to be finished 
Oh, me either. I'm I'm so excited for it. So for today, for the options for the upper receiver that people have to choose from, you have the same options as a lower, uh, meaning you can do forged or you can do billet. And the idea of a forged is the forging is a little bit stronger um, because it's actually hammered aluminum that's forced into a certain shape and then it's milled out. So both options are milled, meaning a, essentially a moving drill press, for lack of a better way to describe it. Still is going to go in and open up the inside and, and, and the finishing pieces on it. But the forging gives you the rough outline of a shape. And you can go back and look at uh, that earlier podcast when we talked about it. You can, I put it in uh, pictures um, of the different types. It's podcast number seven. So number seven you can go back and look at and see what forgings look like before and after. Um, but the billet is just starts with a solid rectangle of aluminum and it's milled away from there. So again, it ends up being the same internal dimensions that's the whole idea you still want it to be interchangeable but the external dimensions can change a little bit you know billet receivers both uppers and lowers are often a little wider because they want more you know meat or material there to work with just for a cosmetic standpoint and it's not to say that billets are even weak they're they're not i've i've never personally even seen a billet receiver break or have a problem with strength so there's no reason not to do it but there's also choices on which grade and which kind of aluminum you go with you know, whether it's anodized or not, things like that. You know, guys that are building their own receivers, which is cool, they're finishing off these 80% receivers. The problem is the cuts that you're making at home that leave shiny silver aluminum, uh, it's not anodized. And the anodization doesn't just make it a pretty color. It actually hardens the surface. Uh, It's a treatment to the metal that is beneficial for more than just cosmetics. So when you drill these holes, when these guys make these cuts, those 80% lowers, and they don't send it off to get anodized afterwards, they actually are going to have soft and weak aluminum there. So um, there's a whole lot more that goes into strength besides just billet or forged. But some of the other options you have on the upper, uh, some of these newer lightweight uppers now are actually not having rails the whole way on the top to save some weight or having some cool cuts. But I guess the first option would be left or right-handed because you know the lower receiver doesn't change much between dedicated left or right but some companies make dedicated left-handed uppers so the ejection port would be on the left side where standard ones are ejection ports on the right side you can buy uh entry level upper receivers that don't even have a dust cover or an ejection port cover so the air 15 has this little trap door that's spring loaded it has a little ball bearing detent that holds it closed And there's a scallop in the bolt carrier, which we'll talk about next, that as the bolt carrier moves back, either by you pulling the charging handle or because you just fired the gun, it pops that door open so it allows the brass to eject. And then when you're done shooting, you can reach up and close the door again. But that's a neat design on the Air 15 that helps keep dirt and junk out of the gun in combat type scenarios. Well, some of these folks that just want to get an entry level AR can save some money in not having to have the little you know, holes for the the pin to go that's the hinge for the door or paying for the door or stuff. They, they can buy one without it. Uh, does yours, Jason, does yours have an ejection port cover on it? It does. And when I actually installed that, I had to modify the spring that sits against the upper receiver. Um, I don't know. I, it has to be just the way they machined it. It fits great, but the mil spec spring was sticking up into the ejection hole. Oh, and right, I had right. To take my Dremel and just trim that down. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, and you can get custom ejection port covers. They even make them out of plastic now. You can get messages put on them. Uh, out there in Mesa, actually, is that cop that has the, you know, the big trouble that he, um, what seems like unjustifiably shot somebody. And uh, he had a inappropriate message engraved in his ejection port cover. So as he started shooting, the message would appear. And that's the first time I've really seen national news pay attention to um, a gun person's message in the trial. It was like a huge deal, and he got in big trouble, and I think it was way worse for him because he had had that bad message in the ejection board cover. So um, anyway, not, not, not saying to stay away from it yourself, just an interesting note. Uh, the, I got a message in mind. Oh, do you? Do we, should we talk yeah. about what it is, or we have to change the rating of the podcast? Nope, nope. It's real simple. Uh, when mine flips open, it just says, let it rain. Nice. All right. Yeah. Is it a black rain ordinance? Yes. Ah, gotcha. 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 Let it rain. All right. That's pretty cool. Uh, the other options you can have uh, on an upper receiver are also on the same side as the ejection port 
You can have a brass deflector, which almost every upper receiver is going to have, especially forged ones. That's that triangle of metal that sticks out behind the ejection port. And that wasn't on early uh, AR-15s. That wasn't on the early M-16s. Um, and they started running into trouble with left-handed shooters because their face was on the right side of the gun, the ejection port was, and the brass was ejecting straight back into their face. So they put that little extra piece of metal on there, and the brass will actually hit that. The brass comes back, I'm just making up an angle, at a 45 degree angle out of the ejection port cover. It doesn't go straight to the side. And so when it hits that triangle of metal, it then redirects it and deflects it more to a 90 degrees. So it shoots across the person's face instead of the end of their face. And you'll see when you shoot your gun, the first 10 shots at your gun, look at that, you'll see the first 10 little tiny brass marks from the brass. The brass will come off on that part of the gun. It's kind of neat to see it build up on that deflector. So that's an option, whether you have a, a slick upper or you have one of those deflectors. And then another option is forward assist. So some AR-15s just don't have forward assists anymore. It's another thing like the ejection port cover. I think it's a good tool. It has a good use, but it adds some complication. It adds some weight, therefore some cost. And uh, if you're not in battlefield conditions, you don't think you're going to need the forward assist, then some people just leave them off completely. Uh, I like to have it there because, I don't know, it's kind of a neat tool to have. Um, and for those of you that don't know what a forward assist is, it's sometimes if a gun gets dirty enough, it's not going to want to go into battery. And we should probably save that for another podcast or else I'll go too deep into what is out of battery firing and stuff like that. But that means the bolt's not all the way closed. And that could not only make the gun not work, but it can also be very unsafe. So, of course, if you're in a self-defense situation, having a gun that doesn't work is unsafe. But if the gun fired while it was out of battery, that could be a problem too, because that means the gun wasn't properly locked up. So if, you're, if an Air 15 gets dirty enough, or any gun, and the bolt doesn't make it all the way home, and you keep yanking the charging handle trying to get the bolt under spring tension to go forward, it may not be enough. You can reach up on an Air 15 with your firing hand, and you can kind of use the heel of your palm underneath the thumb you can smack that forward assist and what it does is it pokes along little ratchets that are ratchet grooves that are cut into the bolt carrier and it physically closes the bolt forward so it'll it'll drive through the sand or the mud to get the bolt closed so cool it's a cool feature um one of the remedial actions that they teach you in the military at the very beginning is an acronym called sports you slap on the bottom remedial action means quick malfunction you don't know what it was you do this really quick, and it solves the majority of malfunctions and gets you back in the fight without having to stop and diagnose what's going on. So again, it's sports, and it stands for slap, pull, observe, release, tap, squeeze. So you <laughs> slap on the bottom of the magazine hard, because that's one of the biggest malfunctions out there, is the mag either comes loose or it wasn't inserted all the way. So slap on the bottom of the magazine, pull the charging handle back. If you can, and it's light enough in the situation as it allows you, you observe to try and see if a piece of brass came out or not. You release the charging handle, you tap that forward assist a couple times, then you can squeeze the trigger. And that's similar to shooting a pistol. Some of you have heard tap, rack, bang. You tap the magazine, rack the slide, and try and shoot again. That's the remedial action. So same thing for an AR-15. It's called sports. And if you don't have a forward assist, you can't do part of that. So whether that matters to you, uh, that's for you to decide. Does yours have a forward assist, Jason? No. I opted for this one not to have the forward assist. Uh, just for the very reason it's going to be my long-range gun. I'm not going to be rapidly shooting through it where it's going to get super dirty like my other so ones. So a bad guy is going to be far enough away? You have enough time to clean them, clear the malfunction? That's the idea. <laughs> it's a long-range gun. I don't, I don't have, I don't have to, to clear the threat immediately. <laughs> you, you, have, you literally have the rest of your life to clear that malfunction. That's the joke they used to say in airborne school for your reserve parachute is if your reserve didn't open because you weren't falling fast enough and therefore there wasn't enough air to open the chute for you, that you literally had to hand over hand reel the parachute back in, pick it up over your shoulder opposite the direction you're spinning, and throw it down into the wind with a vigorous outward motion, or however the military likes saying it, to allow the air to get it to pop open. And if that doesn't work, you reel it in again. And at this point, they'd always say, and do not panic. You know, keep repeating this until it works. Don't panic. You literally have the rest of your life to get that thing to open. So do not worry. <laughs> I always thought that was funny. So yeah, don't don't panic. You, you literally have the rest of your life to get that gun up and running again. Um, okay, so no Ford Assist. I bet it looks kind of cool. Looks a little slicker, I bet. 
It does. It, I really like the way it looks. And there's less parts, so less things maybe to break or go wrong. Does yours have a brass deflector on it? It does. Okay, so you still have something sticking out the side, but not a forward assist. So for those of you that are wondering whether you need a forward assist or not, don't go shopping for an upper without a forward assist just because, but as you can tell, it's not completely necessary unless you are in a battle conditions. But even those that do have Ford Assist ports on the ARs, they sell a couple neat tools or pieces. One of them is just a plug that kind of plugs the hole. So it allows you to have a Ford Assist later if you want without having the extra you know, parts or weight. But another one I've seen is neat is it looks like a Ford Assist, but it's actually just a, um, a port to allow gas to flow through. So when you put a silencer on and you increase the back pressure of an AR, and all that pressure starts coming out of that gun, you know it. You will get pressure in your face. You'll actually, depending on the, the gun and the conditions, you'll get little pieces of oil and, and gas spritzed right out underneath your nose. You'll get like this little tiny mustache from shooting an AR with all the, the carbon and crap coming out of it. So there's companies that'll make this little device that pops in there. It looks like a Ford Assist, but it's just a hole that allows the gas to vent out the side of the gun, which is away from your face for right-handed shooters. I always thought that was kind of a cool addition too. So, all right, you have a milled upper with a brass deflector, ejection port cover, and no forward assist. Correct. Okay. So the only other thing sticking out that you're actually going to see on the outside of an upper receiver is the charging handle. What kind of charging handle did you go with? I got a BCM uh, mid-width charging handle for the scope. I didn't what, like what do you mean for the scope? Uh, this way I could grab and cycle the charging handle without my fingers getting in the way. That's an issue I have with my AAC. Um, my, we have big fingers, so it, it doesn't want to grab it easily or readily available for me to charge the gun with a scope on it. And when he says we have big fingers, he's talking about our family, but don't think we have like freakishly big fingers. We're just, <laughs> we're, we're just uh, a big, big German family. It doesn't, <laughs> we're, we're proportional. Don't, don't, <laughs> Don't think I have like an unfair trigger figure advantage or something. Um, so he's right. So a scope on an AR-15, one of the challenges is, one, the buttstocks and the whole gun was designed to be a carbine, you know, modern carbine. I guess the original M16 wasn't, but carbine meaning shorter, smaller fighting gun. So this gun was supposed to be, I hate to use the term, but assault rifle, if there is such a thing. That was kind of the idea behind it which was not a long, comfortable, easy to lay down behind rifle. It was meant to carry and shoot quick in different directions and different positions. So the problem is, and it wasn't meant to have a scope on it. It used to have a, a carrying handle. It looked like a suitcase handle on the top of the M16, which ironically was the only way you couldn't carry the firearm in the military. You would get in trouble and get yelled at if you were ever caught carrying an, your M16 in basic training by the carrying handle. So go figure on that one. But it wasn't even designed to have a scope. So much later iterations did they put a Picatinny rail and take that carrying handle that you could never use off. And so the problem is scopes, they need a little bit of eye relief, meaning they need to be spaced a certain distance away from your eye to work. And that's designed on purpose so the scope doesn't smack you in the face, of course. Well, the AR-15 receiver is only so long. And when you mount a scope to the AR-15 upper, it usually sticks back too far for most, I don't know what I'd call, full-size males. Uh, you have to crane your head back a little bit to even see through the scope properly. It's unfortunate, but that's just how AR-15s are. Well, the other problem is, if you mount the scope up high, you know, too high, you're not going to get a good cheek weld on the AR, and you can't just build up the cheek rest like you can on a bolt gun, because you build up the cheek rest, your charging handle is not going to work. And so you see all these stocks that have the adjustable cheek rests on them, but they're way far back on the stock. That's because they need to make room for the charging handle. I think those are useless because where I put my cheek on an AR-15 stock is right where the charging handle moves. So having an adjustable stock behind where my cheek is is just silly. You know, if you look at those, you'll notice that that cheek rest, the center of the cheek rest, is only about three inches in front of the buttstock. I can't imagine the position I have to be in to have my shoulder so close up to the side of my head that you know, my cheek would only be a few inches in front of my own shoulder. It just wouldn't be comfortable. So you want to get your scope nice and low. So here we have a problem where the scope is going to be as further back than we want, and it's going to have to be pretty darn low because we can't build up a cheek rest. So a low and rearward mounted scope means that it's going to be hard to grab that charging handle. Uh, it just is. So you want, 
if you can, to get an extended charging handle. And you can get them from anywhere. You can even just buy the latch itself and convert your charging handle. But the danger of doing that is you put more leverage on a piece that wasn't meant to have a lot of leverage on it. So when you reach up and rack the charging handle with just your, you know, your offhand, your left hand, it's nice to have that extra leverage, but be careful, there's still just a little roll pin on most charging handles that you're pulling against. And you get too big, you can break it. But some of these um, sexier aftermarket charging handles like the Bravo Company, uh, the BCM one that, that Jason got, they're beefier, they're built you know, to, to work like this with a scope, where you have, um, I think, AXTS is a nice charging handle. Um, there's a lot, of, you know, they make the Raptor. There's a lot of new designs out there that have wider ears. And Jason, you said medium, right? Yeah, I, I was lucky enough that uh, I was over at uh, Lake Tactical, and we were talking about them, and they actually had some different ones there. And... I really appreciate him letting me put them into a gun and check them out. That's cool. And what seems like a neat place to go hang out and see them. Yeah. Oh yeah. The guys are great. Um, and what he said was very valid and something I didn't even think about when I was actually going to go for the, the larger with one is it gets hung up on your shirt. Whereas with a medium or the mil spec one, that doesn't happen as much. Yep. And the medium one was enough for me to grab and was still comfortable. Completely agree. I've used the latches. Um, they're kind of a skeletonized square shape. It's a normal charging handle, but the latch is longer. And I'm fine with it, but a lot of people's complaints are exactly that. When they're carrying it, it'll get caught in their chest rigs and pull the gun out of battery. Or if it got caught bad enough, you're going to start ejecting rounds having trouble. So um, just one of the shortcomings of an AR-15 is that charging handle and where it's at. So I think you made a good call on that medium there. That's That's a good choice. All right. Yeah, no, I'm super happy with it. All right, let's jump inside the AR-15. Um, the mass inside that is moving back and forth that kind of operates the AR-15 is the bolt and the bolt carrier. So the bolt carrier is the much bigger piece. The bolt is just the front little uh, crenellated, uh, like, castle-looking piece at the very front that, that, that moves in and out and twists. So I'd say five sixth of the the mass and the size of it is the bolt carrier uh what kind of bolt did you go with so i went with a little bit more expensive one i went with the wmd nickel boron full auto okay so let's talk about the one of the choices you have in a bolt carrier the bolt carrier can either be full auto or it can be something other than full auto so it's either uh some companies uh, make small changes to where it's still close to full auto. Some companies, you know, take a lot of material away. But what we're talking about here is the bolt carrier is essentially a tube. It's a tube of steel where you have a cutout on the bottom in the middle of the tube. And that cutout on the bottom allows the hammer to travel up through and into the middle of the bolt carrier to hit the firing pin. Well, on the back of a full auto bolt carrier, the tube is still a tube for about an inch. And all, you know, all the way around before that, that oval in the bottom cuts away. And that tail, that piece of metal in the back that kind of hangs down because it's still a tube, is there to trip the full auto sear. So on an Air 15 that is fully automatic, a machine gun, has a little piece called the full auto sear that sits above the safety. And it just pivots. It's just one little piece that pivots on one little pin. And what it does is when the safety selector is in a position to allow the gun to fire full auto, it actually allows the sear to pop up. Normally, it's it's pulled out of the way by the safety. But the full auto safety allows it to pop up. And when it pops up, it also catches the top of the hammer. And it won't let the hammer go forward on its own. So it's like a second stop to the hammer. So it's not just the, the disconnector or the trigger anymore. It's also this piece. So when the gun cycles, when you're firing it, and the bolt comes to the rear and recocks the hammer... Normally, on a semi-auto trigger, even when you're holding the trigger to the rear, the little disconnector grabs the hammer. And then as you release the tension of the trigger before you pull it again, you, as you're releasing it, you hear that click. That's the jump from that disconnector to the sear on the trigger. Now, sear is a term that's used wrong quite a bit. The sear is nothing more than the part that actually is the functional piece that releases the hammer or the firing pin. That's all it is. So sometimes, like on an AR-15 trigger, the sear is part of the trigger. So that whole trigger mechanism that moves, just the front edge that's ground and polished, it's called the sear. That's the edge. Where some triggers use a completely separate piece for the sear. So like a Remington 700 trigger, 
uses a separate piece. You can actually pick up and hold the sear separate from the trigger. It's the trigger moves, the sear drops, and allows the firing pin to go forward. So just remember the sear is a fancy term for the functional piece or the functional edge or surface or whatever it is that is actually letting the hammer or the firing pin go on a striker fired gun. Well, the full auto sear is like a second sear. So instead of the disconnector catching the hammer, then as you release the trigger, it jumps back to the trigger sear so you can pull the trigger again. When you have the trigger held to the rear on a full auto and this full auto sear is now engaged, it is what holds the hammer by the top of the hammer instead of the bottom like an AR-15 normally does. There's a little hook on the top. So it holds the hammer back for you. And then as the bolt carry comes flying back forward into battery, that very last, I don't know, eighth of an inch it travels as it closes into battery is enough for that tail we were talking about to come forward and push that lever. And that that is a, a mechanism designed that it can't be pushed or moved until that bolt carrier is all the way forward in battery. And as soon as it's in battery and it tips the top of the lever, the bottom of that lever moves out of the way, lets the hammer go, fires the gun, and it keeps going like that until you let go of the trigger. So that full auto bolt carrier has that tail for a reason. And some companies, because they're worried about liability or people converting their guns to full auto somehow, they'll either just mill that straight off so that oval on the bottom that's an opening is just all the way to the back. So it looks kind of like a, a C. If you look at the back of the bolt carrier, it looks like a C shape instead of an O. Uh, some companies just mill out another quarter of an inch away. So it's not enough of a tail to be able to, to reach um, that full auto sear. But they, they can do a lot of different things. But a full auto bolt carrier is what I prefer. One, it's perfectly legal. It's not regulated as a machine gun part. It has nothing to do with it making it a machine gun. But I like it because it makes it heavier and stronger. So as we talked about with the buffer systems, I like a heavy buffer system. I want there to be enough uh, dwell time, which means I want there to, the system to be retarded enough that it doesn't open so fast. I want it to let the bullet get completely out of the gun if it's possible before you know the action opens up nice and slow. But with all that weight too, it keeps the bolt carrier from slamming so fast to the rear of the gun, which is going to be more felt recoil. And it's going to have a whole bunch of mass as it starts moving forward again under spring tension. It's going to have enough mass to strip around out of the magazine and, and chamber home with some authority. Now, competition guns want to get super light, and I get that because they want super light guns. They want super fast cycling guns. And if you're able to tune your gas system right, you can have a lightweight bolt carrier, lightweight buffer, all that still cycle softly, but you have to tune your gas system just right. And then once your gun starts getting really dirty, uh, you're going to start having troubles because that lightweight bolt carrier is not going to have enough, I said mass, but really I mean ass to get through all that, you know, crud. Mm -hmm. So I like a full auto bolt carrier. I'm glad you went with one. Um, now you said nickel boron. Nickel boron. Well, why don't you tell them about that, Jason? Do you, can you talk about it? Uh, as far as I understand, the nickel boron is really more of a coating. Mm -hmm. It is. And a polish. And I like it strictly because it's way easier to clean. And it looks cool. Yeah, it's definitely easier to clean. So there's some lubricity to it inside the gun that actually helps it move better. Uh, it's not to where you can do it, run the gun without lube. An Air 15 is a gun that needs lubrication. That doesn't mean it's a bad design. Uh, I know some people say the Air 15 is a bad gun because you need to run it wet, you know, with, with plenty of lube in it. And they're right. You need to run an Air 15 with lube in it. It's not designed to run dry. You have to keep it lubed. Um, but that's like saying a, a modern engine is bad because it needs oil to run. No, it's just that's how it's designed. Just you wouldn't run your car engine dry. You don't run an Air 15 dry. But it is a slicker, better surface. It's kind of like a hard Teflon. And I like it because it's so nickel boron is the name of the, the coating. And it's got a nickel finish to it because there's a lot of nickel in there, which is kind of neat. It's kind of a silvery gray, you know, finish normally to the gun because that nickel color it gives it. Uh, so you can get a ton of different coatings, though. There are titanium nitride coatings that make the bolts gold colored. Uh, you can do NP3, which is nickel and Teflon. You can do uh, black nitride. You can do ferritic, nitro, ferritic nitro carburization, FNC. You can do Parker's A. You can do all sorts of stuff to them. The nickel boron, though, is my personal favorite because of it's really hard. It's pretty slick. 
And when it gets all dirty and you're done shooting your gun, as long as it's slightly moist still, there's still a little bit of oil in there when you're done, no matter how much you shot for the day. An old t-shirt, one white, and it's shiny silver again. You take those um, black nitrated bolt carriers, like a standard mil-spec bolt carrier, and you have to clean that forever. You sit there with solvent or, or an oily rag to try and wipe it off, and you clean off the black surface, and you think you've cleaned it because it looks clean, but sure enough, you come back later again, and there's still something, and those pores in the metal are exposed, and they just get filled with so much junk. So it's so worth it, the small price increase. I mean, what was the difference for you to get nickel boron or black nitride? Uh, well, it's kind of hard to say because I, I already knew what I wanted because I had the kids as Bushmasters versus my AAC, and just cleaning those two guns, there wasn't a question for me. I oh, know that's I right. You, you have exactly comparison, don't you? Yeah, I do. Oh, did you see, do you agree with me how the, the porous, the Bushmaster or the cheaper one is just, not only is it harder to clean to rub the rag against, it's, you don't even know when it gets clean. I feel so sorry for the kids when they clean their guns. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, so no, I, I already was sold on it. But I know you can get a a cheap, you know, standard black bolt carrier for, I saw them as cheap as like 40, 45 bucks. Yeah. Well, I mean, depending on equal quality, it's usually 10 or 20 bucks more to get a nickel boron. To me, it's so yeah, worth so it. I, I ended up paying, I believe it was 98 bucks. Yeah. And for a for quality my- one. Now, you do not want to get a cheap bolt carrier. Don't go super fancy either, but you want a good bolt carrier. One, you want it to spec. Um, not only externally, but internally where the gas rings, which we'll get to next, are going to have as a surface. But also you want your gas key. The gas key is the snorkel that sticks off the top of the bolt carrier. The vast majority of gas keys are a separate piece. They're starting to make bolt carriers with them all as one unit now, but most of them are not. And so that little snorkel on the top of it has to be screwed into the bolt carrier, usually with two screws. And then staked. Mm -hmm. And a good measure of a bolt carrier. So you're at a gun show, for example, which I don't think I would probably ever buy a bolt carrier at a gun show. But if you did, can you you weren't sure who made it, you could pick it up, you can tell by the coating, and you can look right at those two screws and see if it's properly staked. And I'll try and get a good picture up for you guys. But essentially it's a tool that just comes in and um mashes the metal on both sides of the gas key to make sure the screws don't back out. So an improperly staked gas key immediate sign of a not good quality gun. So you hit all the branding on a gun and ask me if it's a good one. I'm going to probably feel the trigger. I'm going to open it up and look at some of the milling marks on the inside. I'm going to pull the bolt carrier out and I'm going to look at the quality of the bolt and whether the gas key is properly staked. That's one of the major things you look for. And so uh, again, it's, it's actually a tool that comes down and does it, but it looks like someone just took a screwdriver to each side of the metal and just whacked the screwdriver with a mallet and, and, and deformed <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the gas key. But you do not want that coming loose. That comes loose, your gun stops working. So that's bad. Um, so that's another thing to look for. Now, on the inside of the bolt carrier facing forward, the bolt carrier also holds the firing pin, the little firing pin retaining pin, which is usually a cotter pin. Um, and for those of you that don't know, a firing pin on an AR-15 looks kind of like a, a, a double-headed framing nail. You know, And the cotter pin goes between the two heads or shoulders of the nail, you know, for lack of a better term. Well, the bolt, when it goes into the front of the bolt carrier, and it's held in by a cam pin, which allows the bolt to articulate not only in and out a little amount, but to twist as it goes in and out, and that's what helps the gun lock up. Um, The bolt itself has gas rings on it, typically three gas rings. Some companies make their own proprietary system, but the standard is a three gas ring system. Those gas rings have to have a tight fit inside the bolt carrier because the gas that comes out of the uh, gas tube, which we'll get to later, it doesn't just blow the bolt carrier back. It actually goes in through that little snorkel, that gas key, gets redirected down into the bolt carrier, and it pushes forward on the bolt. So it, it pushes rearward on the inside of the bolt carrier, and it wants to expand and those gas rings from the bolt make such a tight seal. As it expands, it shoves the bolt out. So I guess the best analogy is think of the old-fashioned air pressure gauges that you put them on the tire, the little, you know, a thing in the back pokes out, you know, shoots out and has some numbers on it. That's kind of what the bolt does in the front of the bolt carriers. The pressure makes it pop out the front. So if the gun's not running right, you can actually have, you know, maybe bad gas rings um, that, that'll cause... Uh, 
it's too short stroke or, or, or not cycle properly. So on a gun that's been run for quite a few thousand rounds, you might want to replace the gas rings. They cost almost nothing, and it's an easy fix. Um, for those of you that are going to worry about this, I, I can't even remember when the last time I changed gas rings, so don't worry about it. But there's a really easy way to test. is When the bolt and the bolt carrier are assembled, and you're about to put the gun back together and they're cleaned, take the bolt carrier in your hand and shake it really hard so that the bolt pops out on its own. And then stand the bolt carrier up on a table on the bolt's face. And if the bolt stays and the bolt carrier stays extended in the extended position under its own weight, your gas rings are tight enough. As your gas rings start to wear down, when you set the bolt carrier on the table trying to stand up on a bolt face, the weight of the bolt carrier will start to sag and sink down on its own. And that's like the easiest way to test if your gas rings need replacing. So there you go. There's a simple test to see how old you know those gas rings are if they need replacing. Now, uh, something for you guys too when you're reassembling a, an AR-15 bolt carrier, there's little gaps in the gas rings. I've always been told you're supposed to make sure those gaps aren't all aligned because it makes sense. I guess the gas would just go by. So I've always done it. But that's one of those things I've never tried and tested and proven. So maybe I should do that on my own before I keep giving on potentially bad information. But make sure the gas rings, uh, the, the gaps aren't aligned. Um, do you have your own bolt, Jason? Or are you waiting for the JP bolt? No, no, it came with uh, a bolt that's on it, but I'm going to replace it when I get the JP. Gotcha. So you're just going to use the bolt that came with it as a backup? Yeah. Okay. So that's a good idea because that's the more common parts that break on the AR-15 are really the bolt or the extractor or ejector. So having a backup bolt is not a bad idea at all. Um, in that bolt, you're going to have your ejector pin, which is a little spring-loaded pin that shoots the you know brass casing out. And then you're going to have the extractor, which is a little claw that pulls the brass out of the chamber and also holds the corner. So when the ejector pops the other side of the brass, it allows it to pivot and pop out of the ejection, uh, the ejection port. Now, the bolt on an AR-15 is supposed to be uh, uniform. It's supposed to be the same size lugs so that any barrel will work. You don't have to worry about headspace issues like you would on a, on a bolt-action rifle. But if you really want truly precise, it's a good idea to have a barrel made precisely for a particular bolt so you have the exact right measurements and that's what Jason's doing. So his barrel is actually coming with its own bolt that has been set up and headspaced exactly to that barrel. So that's kind of cool. So he'll be able to use that one instead and then have a backup bolt in there. So, And I, and I wanted to correct myself on the bolt carrier. I knew I was wrong when I said it. I just had to look it up. I paid $189 for that bolt carrier. Must be nice to be made of money, Jason. Hey, side jobs. I've been doing <laughs> side jobs for this whole project. Just for everybody. So I, I hope we covered uh, enough about the upper receiver and the parts for you guys to maybe learn something and not too much to completely bore you. I guess if I completely bored you, this apology wouldn't matter because you'd have stopped listening. But <laughs> you have. Uh, we can go into more stuff later if you guys have questions about how to tell or how to get an extractor out of the bolt and what to look for. Or you know, if an injector gets stuck or, you know, all those kind of things. But the things you should be looking for and your options are left or right hand, uh, brass deflector or not, ejection port cover or not, forward assist or not, type of charging handle, your bolt carrier, what to look for in different types of bolt carriers, different coatings, and what a quality bolt carrier looks like, and then the, the bolt and gas rings and a couple of the parts that go in there. So we're making it through your project pretty good, Jason. I think next we're going to talk about your barrel. Yes, uh, barrel, gas tube, and gas block. Okay, so next episode, we will do that. We'll talk about the barrel and all the parts that go on there, and then maybe finish up with hand guards and maybe a muzzle device after that, and then we're done, and your rifle will be done by then, too, because your barrel's going to be on your gun next week. And I did the math on everything, and we are within $25 of what we guessed the build was going to cost. That's funny. What what did what, is, what did we guess the build was going to cost? I was guessing uh, high end sixteen hundred, and it's right there. Well, still for sixteen hundred, it's a lot of money. You're it you're is. getting a better gun than you could have purchased for sixteen hundred, I think. Oh, and during this whole process, I've learned I could really build a cheap throw around AR fifteen for about four hundred and fifty bucks. Oh, definitely, mm -hmm. and you can build a very so, decent, you know. If you only had one AR-15, 
to have, you know, a decent kind of all around air 15 for under a thousand. You know, so for everyone that here's the cost that Jason went through here, that's only because he was trying to do the best of each part and he wanted absolute precision. He wanted, you know, custom uppers and lowers. So don't get discouraged. It's not going to necessarily cost you that. Matter of fact, I bet you could get 95% as good as Jason's Air 15 and still stay under the thousand dollar mark if you really tried. Oh, I think so. You know, because like his upper and lower receivers, they're nice, but they're not going to make the gun shoot better at all. Right. You know, the buttstock's not going to make the gun shoot better. The charging handle's not going to make it shoot better. Um, yes, if you had a bad bolt carrier and it wasn't reliable, okay, I get it. But the accuracy is really going to, and this gun is going to come down to having a good trigger, good bolt, and a good barrel. You know, everything else is, is not cosmetic, but kind of. So, well, good, good. I'm excited. It's coming along. All right, well, I was going to cover some more long-range topics you know, to try and teach you guys something else, but we've already been going for about 40 minutes, so I figure I'll just <laughs> I'll respond to uh, one of the good emails I got asking for questions, and I have a new system in place, so if you sent me something and I didn't respond to it yet, uh, don't be afraid to send it to me again. I have a system I'm going to be tracking the notes that I can have here for, for me when we're doing each podcast, and so I don't forget about the email from two weeks ago. Um, we have Christopher uh, wrote in and said some ideas for a podcast he'd like to hear talked about or about, you know, spotting. So what it means to be a good spotter, what that communication looks like, how to set up, what kind of spotting scope. Well, that's a whole podcast in and of itself, I think. But there is one thing I'd really like to talk about to get you guys thinking about long range shooting again is communication. That was the first thing he listed too, which I was impressed on his bullet pointed list. That that's such a thing that people often skip over is communication with the shooter. Um, I constantly have to correct students on this. And I see it all the time in videos that are people are talking about how to do long range shooting. I see it all the time with the range. And it makes such a big difference is everybody likes to talk about everything but what it takes to hit the target. So what I mean is... Um, and this is also, we'll do this as another episode, but people tend to run rifles. So let's go to the sniper world for a little bit here. They like to run rifles um, like they're not just any other firearm. You know, most of these cops or military guys I would train would be shooting a, a course with their handgun, for example. And, at the, and the, as the course finished and their slide locked to the rear on their handgun, they would never stand there with the handgun in their hand with the slide locked to the rear looking at their target and, going, and pointing out some of the holes to their buddy and going, hey, look at that one. That one's pretty cool. Look at that. Oh, I pulled that one a little bit. Oh, yeah, no big deal. And sit there chatting with a slide locked back. They all would immediately get that old empty magazine out, get a fresh magazine in, and get the gun back up and running. And some guys even like to do some really silly tactical Dan scanning and you know whatever they want to do when they're done shooting every drill before they put their gun away. That's perfectly normal, but for some reason on bolt guns, people like to sit there with the bolt to the rear and just stare at the pretty group. And that, that's just, even if you're hunting, what sense does it make to shoot once and pull the bolt to the rear and not have, you know, round in there for a follow up shot? So I'm all about, especially if you missed, getting the next shot on the target. So I don't want to focus on why you necessarily missed. Uh, I, I paused a little bit when I was saying that because. I do believe that it's more important to know why you missed than to not know why you hit, but that's like a bigger overarching theory on learning how to shoot. You know, if I have a student that missed a certain way, but they know what they did wrong, I will take that any day than a person that shot and shot great and has no idea why they did it because they can't replicate that then. But the guy that missed and knows why, he can work on getting better. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about uh, maybe where you missed. So if Jason, you were shooting and I was your spotter and to go back to some earlier podcasts to bring the information back for you guys, we can talk about minutes of angle. Uh, we're at 600 yards and Jason hits six inches low. You all should know right away that that is a one minute angle up adjustment. Okay. Well, if Jason shoots and doesn't communicate properly with me or I don't communicate properly with him and we're in an actual situation where we're trying to either in a competition or hunting or, or military or police context. Who knows what it is? Um, we can spend a lot of wasted time talking about what happened and a lot of confusion. And the animal can walk away or the bad guy can hurt somebody or you can lose time in the competition. Because what 
typically happens, especially on YouTube videos and at the range with everybody that has all the equipment and thinks they're tactical Dan, is Jason shoots and I'm looking through the spotting scope and the next thing out of my mouth is, oh, so close, man. You were just like, just barely below it. And Jason, okay. Jason would then, as he took his head off the gun and is looking at me, so he now has lost the target, he with the bolt to the rear would go, well, how far low? And I'd be like, mm, man, that was like six inches low. Was that a good shot? That was a good one? Yeah, oh, that's weird, because it wasn't six inches low last time for over here at this target. Huh, well, I guess it's a little low this time. All right, well, we need to come up a little bit. Well, how much should we come up? Uh, six inches. Well, come up, come up just six inches or one, one minute. Come up one minute. And then Jason comes up one minute, and then he gets back on the gun and reloads the gun, or even worse, forgets to put the bolt back forward, which happens all the time, because you're looking through the scope. So let's say he gets the gun up running and then finally shoots again. That is so much wasted time and chance for error and chance for you to to either miss the target is gone or, or you lose time in a competition. What should be happening is Jason shoots, I see the impact, and the first thing out of Jason's mouth should be his call for that shot. Because if Jason pulled the shot low and doesn't tell me, then I'm going to adjust based on that miss, expecting the next shot to be a hit. So if he's not honest with me and doesn't tell me his call, I see that and I make a correction. Guess where the next shot's going to go? Over the target. It's going to be six inches high next time because he didn't tell me it was his mistake. Okay, well, let's make it bigger. Let's make it 18 inches. Let's make it three minutes. So he jerks the trigger. I see the impact 18 inches low. I give him an 18 inch or three minute up correction. He shoots again. He's not going to be 18 inches high because he didn't tell me. So first thing out of Jason's mouth is center. Or left, right, up, or down. Center means the bullet went where he wanted it to. Okay? Don't get confused later when we talk about wind calls. If I had him holding, let's say, one mil left, and it was a good shot, I'm still going to want him to say center, even though he wasn't directly center with the reticle on the, on the target. I hope that makes sense. I just make that worse. So a good shot is center. A bad shot is, oh, crap, I screwed that up. I have no idea. That was a bad one. Uh, insert an explicative here, or actually tell me low if you can, or oh, that was left. Don't get worried about seven o'clock, three inches. Just tell me, you know, low left or oh crap, bad one. And if it's not a life or the situation, I'm just going to have you shoot the same thing again. I'm going to say, okay, do it again. And Jason's going to ask me, well, well, where was it? And I'm going to tell him it doesn't matter because I don't want him, <laughs> you know, knowing in his brain, you know, which way to concentrate more or less on. So it doesn't matter. Shoot again. And then when he gives me another good shot and he says center, so the gun recoils. And as he's reaching up to the bolt to run that bolt, if it's a bolt action, he's hollering out center to me. He's not taking any time at all. And if he says center and it's 18 inches low, I can immediately say back up three minutes. Jason reaches over, dials up three minutes and shoots again. That's it. It's that simple. You also don't need to do all this Hollywood uh, shooter ready, spotter ready send it sending or whatever else you could say in there that's again that's more wasted breath that's more wasted time you need to shoot if you're using a spotter and it's not again life or death you need to shoot when the spotter's ready well i as a spotter am going to let you know i'm ready when i give you a wind call i'm not going to say spotter ready just because you're going to be getting your breath right and your position stable the last thing i want you to do is to start talking and moving your jaw and your chest i want you to shoot the target so if I'm looking through my spotting scope and I decide that the wind call is going to be one mil left, when I see that you're ready and in position, I'm going to say one mil left. And that's your chance now to hold one mil left and apply a proper trigger control and shoot the target and then give me your call and then we can go from there. Now, as the wind keeps changing, I'm going to keep watching it. And even if you take a certain amount of time to shoot, that's fine. I'll keep updating it. I can say one mil left, one and a quarter left. One mil left. I can update it as I see the wind changing. That's fine. And once you're ready and you're able to get a good wind call, you shoot. That's because, as we'll talk about in a future podcast, wind is the hardest thing in the world to deal with when you're shooting long range. And one of the reasons it's hard to deal with is not that it's just hard to see, which it is, but it changes constantly. So if I give you a wind call and we talked for another 10 minutes, the wind's going to be different. And it's going to matter, too, on the scope. I mean, like, you're you're calling them out minute of angle up, and then you're calling mills left. 
the shooter needs to let you know what he knows and what he doesn't know. Like, for instance, I'm going to have a minute of angle scope, not a milliradian scope. Is your reticle going to be in mils or minutes? It's going to be in minutes. Okay, well then, yeah, great point, Jason. I would be then giving the wind call in minutes. But either way, the, to me, the spotter says he's ready. Or she. <laughs> the spotter says they're ready when they give a wind call. That's when I'm looking through the scope. That's when I'm ready to go. And wouldn't you want to shoot immediately after the wind call so the wind doesn't have a chance to change? Of course. So that's why we use that. So I would say, for Jason's example here, I can say three and a half minutes left. Jason moves the scope three and a half minutes left, applies proper trigger control, shoots. Right after he shoots, he calls his shot. Center. When I see that 18 inches low at 600 yards, I just call back to him, up, three minutes. That's super simple. Now, if you really want to, in a tactical situation where life and death might matter, you might have the shooter repeat it. I've done that sometimes too. Just have the shooter come back and say, up, three minutes, as they're making the adjustment. Uh, That's sometimes good to do because it's a lot better than okay. And I don't know if Jason heard me when he says okay. And I also don't know if Jason made the adjustment yet because maybe something else is going on with the rifle. So sometimes the feedback from the shooter is nice because it confirms the right call and it lets me know they're making the adjustment if I can't see him. And then guess what I do again? I give a wind call and he shoots again. So spotter shooter communication is, I think, incredibly important to minimize it. Wind call, shot, call the shot, adjustment to get a hit. Now notice the adjustments were to get a hit. It's not an adjustment that where the miss was. It is irrelevant to the entire situation that Jason knows that he missed 18 inches low. It does not matter. What matters only is what adjustment he needs to make to get a hit the next time. So there's probably some philosophical life lesson there about not dwelling on the mistake and focusing only on what there is to do right. But that makes a big difference when you're shooting. It's also important to know that you adjust to the center of the target. Okay, so if Jason was shooting a 30-inch target, 30-inch circle at 600 yards, that means from the center of the edge, we have 15 inches. If Jason missed off the bottom edge of the target by just three inches, and just barely went under the target, there are many of you that would see that and go, oh, that was like three inches of a mess. Come up one minute. Because bringing him up one minute, which should bring him up six inches, which will get him to hit the target. But you don't adjust to the edge of the target. You adjust to the center. So I would still say up three minutes to bring him all the way to the center of the target. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. So Christopher, I hope that answered your, at least part of your question. Communication with the shooter should be simple and clear. Uh, you cannot imagine how hard it is when you're on a firing line with a bunch of other shooters in a uh, professional situation where there's people shooting back at you and other noises going on, you know, or, or you're doing it over radio or even worse if you're far away from each other. Um, keep it simple. Wind call from the spotter means shoot. Shooter calls the shot, and you've got to be honest, shooter. I would always rather a shooter uh, err on the side of, I don't know if that was good or not. Again, if it's not life or death, I'd just have Jason shoot again. And if he put two bullets in the exact same spot, well, then now I know it's you know something reliable. And uh, you always tell the shooter what to do to hit, not how far they missed. So... And- and for those who are just learning, like myself, I'm constantly trying to practice memorizing my minutes of angle, because um, that's been a complete change for me getting into this long-range shooting and learning that the minute of angle starts at 100 yards um, and, and grows. And the earlier podcasts in the book have been great on that aspect. I well, appreciate it, man. Uh, you guys want to listen more about that? Go back to episode four. Episode four of this podcast talks about minutes of angle and mills. Talk to other angular measurements. And of course, thank you for the book plug. That's the whole point of doing the podcast is one, to help you guys learn more, but to sell more books. So <laughs> go buy the Long Range Shooting Handbook if you haven't or buy it for a friend. Uh, 25% of the proceeds go to two awesome military charities. Um, you guys have been great for the support. Uh, it finally got knocked out of first place on Amazon, which is a shame. It, it was the best-selling book, <laughs> number one for like s- the first six months straight. And then uh, John Lott, he's a, uh, a statistician that writes uh, great books for the Second Amendment. He wrote More Guns, Less Crime, and now he came out with his most recent book. So he's a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, so if I got to have someone knock me out of first place, it's a New York Times bestselling author. That makes sense. But I'm going to get him. I'm gunning for him to get back in there. Uh, so it's still number two or, or three, depending on the day. 
Uh, but you guys go p- pick it up on Amazon. Again, it's a long-range shooting handbook, or you can purchase it at longrangeshootinghandbook.com. If you buy it through the book's website, uh, it comes from me. I autograph it to you um, and, and ship it out. So I really appreciate the support. And it, it breaks down what Jason's talking about, uh, not only in the simplest way I could do it, but in a way that allows you just to read it over and over if you want and keep it with you in the range bag to get it. You know, And, and one of the tips is the second you hear the distance, automatically start thinking, you know what the minutes of angle are going to be for that distance. So when I set it 600 yards, if you use my technique, you immediately start picturing six, six inch chunks. So then when I say next, an 18 inch adjustment, you then know that three of those six inch chunks go into that 18 inch adjustment. Uh, if I just lost you, again, go back to podcast number four or pick up the book. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Please send your questions in. I have to ask Ryan questions all the time. So he's actually part to blame why we haven't been doing podcasts because he'll call me and we'll talk about his gun and we'll actually get off and talk about good stuff (laughs) and we'll say, man, we should save this for the podcast, but then we get it resolved and so we never cover it again. So, uh, sincere apologies, folks. I'm going to try and do more. I think I have Jason's permission just to do podcasts on my own. I just keep forgetting that I should just pull out the microphone and, and, and talk about things. Uh, one of the next topics will be ballistic coefficient. So if you're interested in the difference between G1 and G7, you know, uh, base projectiles and what the ballistic coefficient is and why it matters. Uh, I'll, I'll cover that next. So Jason, do you have anything else to talk about? No, I think we've done real good on what we've covered tonight. All right. Thanks, man. Everyone. I appreciate you listening again. Spread the word. Take care guys. Take care.